ancient chroniclers record a tragedy. The great portals were shut. The courtiers were head on knee. The people mourned. A living god, a beloved leader, the pharaoh is dead. To compound the tragedy, the pharaoh is young, his death sudden. Whenever death comes too soon, suspicion is never far behind. The body is barely cold, and already rumors of foul play creep through the palace. As they prepare the pharaoh for burial, the royal morticians wisely keep their hands busy and their mouths shut. Outside a hastily finished tomb, the final rites of the dead are performed by the king's favorite minister and his young wife. Valley of the Kings, the Pharaoh's body is entombed for eternity. So it's hoped is the secret of his death. Three thousand years after Tutankhamun's death, two of America's top detectives are reopening the casebook on the death of the young Pharaoh. Can modern investigative techniques solve the mystery behind the boy king's premature death? Mike King and Greg Cooper think so. We're after the fact-finding side of this, but also as you learn more about this amazing story and the people involved in this story, uh, you, you become uh, an individual who wants to see justice occur. Now that the question has been asked, who was he? And how did he die? Was it legitimate? It must be answered. And that's the purpose of this investigation. Cooper and King have cracked some of the toughest murder cases in modern crime. But trying to solve a 3,000 year old murder will present its own difficulties. When a police officer shows up at a death scene, the first response is to secure that area so that forensics experts can come in and gather those very specific clues. Uh, unfortunately, with Tutankhamun, we don't have that opportunity to go and secure something that occurred uh, more than 3,000 years ago. Tens of thousands of tourists visit Tut's tomb every year. Most overlook the clues a trained eye seeks. We're attempting to recreate the cause of his death and the manner of his death. And when you do so, you do so through every means that's, that's available to you. And what we have is a burial site to begin with. And so it becomes important to look at that particular location to determine if there's any artifacts that may suggest the method and manner of his death. The disposal site, Tut's tomb, was discovered in 1922. Took archaeologist Howard Carter more than five years to find it. The decisive moment had arrived. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left hand corner. At first, I could see nothing, but presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, I was struck dumb with amazement. Howard Carter had made one of the greatest discoveries of all time, the intact treasures of an Egyptian pharaoh. Carter's find and the way Tut's corpse was removed from the tomb 
will have a direct bearing on the detective's investigation. Unaware he had stumbled on the scene of a crime, Carter began removing the tomb's contents piece by piece. Unknowingly, he was tampering with evidence. Fortunately, before removing the artifacts, Carter meticulously catalogued every item, leaving the detectives a treasure trove of clues. Here, Cooper and King will find their first leads. One of the things that we've learned over the years is that every death really should be treated as a homicide. The initial investigation, uh, the gathering of evidence, the, the gathering of clues and interviewing of witnesses should all be treated as though it were an actual homicide. Every homicide investigation begins with a body. Thanks to the ancient Egyptian practice of mummification, Tutankhamun's body survived 30 centuries. Recovering the mummy from the tomb took Howard Carter three years of painstaking excavation. Like a Russian doll, the pharaoh's sarcophagus nested within a series of shrines. Once Carter recovered the corpse, he wanted to establish the cause of death. In 1925, he invited a leading British anatomy professor, Douglas Derry, to autopsy tut. Cooper and King returned to Derry's report. They're searching for clues he overlooked. They brought in their own medical expert. Ernst Rodin is a professor of neurology at the University of Utah. Long fascinated by Tutankhamun, he's been piecing together medical evidence on the pharaoh's death for more than 20 years. Howard Carter's prime interest as an archaeologist are the artifacts and not a medical examination. To remove the pharaoh's body from its coffin, Derry resorted to drastic measures. In the process, they had to dismember the body. Derry severed Tutankhamun's head, sliced through his abdomen, and ripped his limbs from his body. Critical forensic evidence was destroyed. Derry failed to establish a cause of death, but one part of his report still intrigues the detectives. On the left cheek, just in front of the ear lobe, is a round depression, the skin filling it resembling a scab. Round the circumference of the depression, which has slightly raised edges, the skin is discolored. Some experts believe the lesion is evidence of an arrow wound. Rodin advances a different explanation. Less sensational, but for Tutankhamun, potentially lethal. It is also possible with the insects uh, that are around uh, that uh, there was an insect bite uh, and uh, as a result of the insect bite he might have developed sepsis. Did Tutankhamun die of natural causes? So far, Cooper and King think it's unlikely. The fact that he was young, uh, that he had the best of care and the best of protection, it wouldn't lead us to believe or conclude probably, anyway, that he died from natural causes. If he lived until he was 18 years old, the chances of him living an exceedingly long life, or at least consistent with the rest of the pharaohs, which generally most of them lived to an old age, uh, would have been consistent and common for him as well. We would expect the same thing. The detectives are puzzled by the way Tutankhamun was interred. All the evidence suggests he was buried in a hurry. A rushed burial doesn't square with death by natural causes. If this was a king who became ill and over time passes away, if that were the case, then the evidence wouldn't support by a speedy burial and a rushed tomb preparation. It was unexpected, and they didn't have time to plan for it. Why? He either died from an accident, 
or homicide. To uncover hard evidence about Tutankhamun's death, the detectives turn to the crime scene itself. First stop, Tutankhamun's tomb. Final resting place, perhaps, of the clues to a murder. As part of their investigation, modern science will finally put a face on the victim. But will Tutankhamun prove the model of perfection his famous death mask portrays? The Valley of the Kings will be the detectives' first stop as they embark on a search for clues in the murder of Tutankhamun. As in a modern homicide investigation, the detectives will begin where the body was found. For ancient Egyptians, the pictures painted in their tombs served as a last testament to the gods. Perhaps they'll offer clues to Tut's life and death. Egyptian authorities have given Cooper and King special clearance to enter the lower chamber, off limits to most visitors. By looking at the behavior, whether it be through the crime scene or the disposal site in this case, or the types of caricatures that we find within the walls of the tombs, I think we'll see a real indication of what kind of things were going on at that time politically, religiously, and I think emotionally. For the detectives, the burial vault is a treasure trove of clues, a place they'll return to time and again. Look at this, Mike. It's a, it appears to be the top of the sarcophagus. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it doesn't match the stone and the inlay and the design? It's clearly inconsistent, isn't it? Which suggests uh, what? Something of a hurried fashion that was incomplete. The uh, unguents there, how uh, they seem to have spilled over or leaked out. I wonder why that wasn't cleaned up in immediately after it occurred. Cooper and King are convinced the undue haste with which Tut was buried points to a cover up. He's just been not just disposed of, but just cast aside like he never existed. And that causes a very significant question, especially considering who he was. Their conclusion is shared by the last man who looked on the face of the boy king, a man whose evidence will prove invaluable to the detectives. In 1968, Professor R.G. Harrison of Liverpool University